recording. There we go. And I'm going to make you host wave. Okay. Something got disabled there. Okay. Share. Uh, what the hell? <laughs> that did work. Um, do our screen sharing. Okay, let's go to the program. Uh, there you go. Go to the go back first one. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> that was very over the top. Um, before I get started, I just want to. Um, uh, continue a, a discussion about the field trips. Uh, last year, as you may remember, I was field trip chairman and it was a hell of a job arranging for all of those field trips. Uh, but I recovered over the winter shoveling a ton and a half of snow and I'm ready to, uh, I'm ready to take up uh, organizing some field trips uh, this spring, hopefully by May. It is my hope and expectation that um, most of us will have gotten our second shot by uh, May, or if you get the J&J &J vaccine, your first and only shot. Uh, no, no. Um, so uh, I think that we'll feel sort of confident uh, in, um, in proceeding with some field trips with guidance from the CDC as uh, May approaches. Sharon and I got uh, our first shot and we're due for our second shot in a couple of weeks. Nothing, just keep going. Um, Sharon got the Moderna vaccine. I got the Russian vaccine. I volunteered to get the Russian vaccine. It's called Sputnik. I couldn't resist getting something called Sputnik. I love weird names like that. So if there's a, a candy bar or a soft drink or a breakfast cereal that's called Sputnik, I'm going to get it. Sputnik, the breakfast for Ruski champions. I was going for Russian there. I, I don't know if I got there. I, could have done Latvian for all I know. Okay, um, so if anybody has any suggestions about field trips, uh, please email them to me. Um, if you wanna lead a field trip, that would be great. You don't have to be an expert to, um, to lead a trip. All you have to do is um, make sure that there's parking available, bathrooms, a place to eat lunch, that sort of thing, the logistics. There'll be plenty of people who are experts at Butterfly identification. How do I go to the next one? Okay, thanks to um, Rudy Giuliani, um, a lot of uh, presenters now have to put up a disclaimer. This is my disclaimer. Um, I'll give you a moment to uh, to read it. We don't want to get uh, the parent organization of NABA in any trouble. So there, I think we've, uh, I hate doing these Zoom meetings. I can't tell if anybody's laughing. Okay, so um, Sharon and I like to give programs to incoming administrations because um, one of the toughest jobs for president is to find uh, enough speakers. So um, this is my, uh, my effort in that regard. It combines my love of butterflies with my keen interest in history. So butterflies lost, it uh, basically it's gonna be a very brief uh, history of butterflies that have disappeared in New Jersey post World War II. And those that are declining or otherwise vulnerable that we may lose soon. So this, Sharon did this nice, uh, nice screen here of a silver boarded fritillary and you can see it's fading, fading, going, going. And the last year we saw it was 2012. So as far as we know, by 2013, it had disappeared from the state. I'm gonna show a few uh, tables first. And I know what you're thinking. Oh gosh, tables, charts, statistics, graphs. That's a terrible thing to do for an evening meeting. Um, you've probably all had a large uh, dinner and maybe more than a few glasses of wine, knowing uh, the membership as I do. 
So we're gonna go through these tables pretty quickly. I just put it up here for convenience in case anybody wants to go back through the program, they can see all of this information in one spot. Now the first five species I grouped together because there's strong circumstantial evidence at any rate that pesticides had a lot to do with their disappearance. Uh, Regal fritillary, the next one down below, the pesticide impacted species uh, disappeared for different reason. And then you'll notice the first nine or so species, we don't really have a firm date as to the, or the year as to the, um, when they disappeared. In fact, we're not even sure of the decade in many cases. It's only beginning with Mitchell Sater that we can firm up an actual year, in that case, 1986. And then on the far right, I have um, postulated reasons for their uh, disappearance. And then the next one is about resident species that I view that may be in trouble. And we're gonna be covering each one of these uh, an individual species account shortly. <clears throat> and then there's our yard, which we've kept detailed butterfly notes in since um, 1992, uh, virtually daily records. And these are the species that have disappeared in our yard since that time and the reason for their disappearance. So coral hair streak disappeared in 1995, reasons unknown. Dusted skipper two years later, we're pretty certain that was due to an Eastern Phoebe um, that nested on our house. And we actually saw on two different occasions the Phoebe come down and knock off a uh, dusted skipper. And as we only saw three or four at any one time, it's uh, pretty good evidence that the Phoebe had something to do with that. And it has, of course, never reappeared. That is to say the skipper hasn't. Compton tortoiseshell, 2001. We had that yearly, multiple individuals yearly from 92 to 2000. And then after that, nothing. Aphrodite, 2002. Long Dash, 2003. Then there's a gap to Leonard Skipper. That disappeared in 2012. And then more recently, Indian Skipper in 2016. We have not seen that in the past four years. And these are some of the possible reasons for uh, the extirpation or decline in one or more of the species. The first two involve uh, pesticides. I'm gonna use pesticide and insecticide interchangeably. Third one down is reforestation and accelerated development of open habitats beginning post-World War II when there was an, uh, a booming economy. Um, and then the rest of these, the next several involve perhaps um, more local impacts to, um, to uh, species, extreme weather, increase in predators, pathogens, and of course, collecting. And then the bottom four, uh, more widespread perhaps, I want you to draw your attention to increased deer browsing of host plants and other native vegetation. New Jersey's had a terrible overabundance of deer for many, many decades now. And the deer management policy in New Jersey just keeps the population at an artificially unacceptable and tolerable high level. Um, and it has, it's denuded our forests, these uh, overabundance of deer, uh, increase in ticks, um, all kinds of problems related to overabundance of deer. Then there's management activities along utility lines Overmanagement, undermanagement, improper management. And another important one, a massive, massive increase in alien invasive vegetation at the cost of butterfly host plants. And then one that Sharon came up with, reduced wraps and insulating snow cover for caterpillars or pupae. I'll just go over a couple of these brief, uh, some of these briefly. So Power lines get sprayed with herbicide. The herbicide is generally geared toward killing woody vegetation. What impact the herbicide has directly on caterpillars uh, is not as well documented as the impact that pesticides have, but I can't imagine it's gonna be good for them. So there's probably lethal and sublethal impacts 
to caterpillars. There's also the direct impact to uh, butterfly host plants. And by host plant, I mean the plants that the caterpillars feed on and, um, and nectar plants as well. And then insecticide spraying in forest to kill gypsy moth caterpillars. We're gonna discuss that in more detail in a bit. The um, overabundance and, and incredible spread of uh, so many, so many alien invasive species. This is a, um, a shot of a Northern Metalmark site that Sharon and I work at. <clears throat> and the, the murderer's row here of, um, of alien invasive species there, you can see in orange, Oriental bittersweet, you can practically watch that grow. Uh, autumn olive, Maro's honeysuckle, Japanese stilt grass. We know Japanese stilt grass has eliminated some metal mark colonies. And in this particular site here, it's the bittersweet, the autumn olive, and the Maro's honeysuckle primarily. There's also natural vegetation succession. So in, two, uh, in the 1990s, Sharon and I found a uh, a meadow that's part of Swartzwood State Park. You can see that in the upper left. Um, this was notable because we found a, a fairly robust population of long dash there. But as you can see in the lower right, 13 years later, um, virtually the same sort of photograph, uh, you can see all of the um, shrubs that have invaded that area. And even in the areas that look open, it became absolutely smothered with uh, dewberry, which is a sort of a rubus. It's a native species. So there are invasive native species, which are a problem as well. And that rubus, that trailing rubus, which just you know, trails right over the ground, uh, virtually can cover large fields and inhibit the growth of, um, of other more desirable species. So in 2002, there were plenty of long dash. In 2015, there were no long dash. And this place looks even worse now, just a few years later. Well, development we know about, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, it doesn't really matter. A lot of good butterfly habitats been developed or otherwise modified. And another impact that most people don't think of is uh, uh, monoculture agriculture. So what the state does is on various land holdings, they lease out land to farmers. And I think they make a real, just a pittance in doing that. And the farmer, at least most, most recently, they plant corn or soybeans, something like that, which is not particularly valuable for butterflies or, or most any insect. And you can see here in this photograph in the lower right, taken at Jenny Jump State Forest, this is the the low portion of, Len of Jenny Jump, um, what we call the Beaver Brook wetlands. The Beaver Brook is a tributary of the Pequist River. And you can see on the right here of that photograph, the farmer planted corn. But there's a gap between the corn and the purple loosestrife you see in the center and on the left. And there's a gap there because that area was too wet for the corn to grow. But the farmer disked it anyway. You can see the corn hasn't come up. So our idea was to um, hopefully try and convince the state to, um, in that wetland area where you see the modified ag wetland letters, uh, to uh, do a, um, an appropriate seed mix for pollinators that would be geared toward a um, wetland soil conditions. The farmer is supposed to leave up 15%, 10 to 15% of his crop anyway for wildlife value. You can see the area in the center and on the left is a natural wetland. Um, I know that many of you don't like purple loosestrife. I think it's a good uh, it's a good pollinator plant for many species of insects, including a lot of butterflies. But you can also see there's purple uh, there's um, New York ironweed, and the shrubs there are willows. So there's viceroys there. It's a nice place for butterflies, but it could be made a lot better if um, it was handled or managed a bit differently. All right, now we're gonna to get to the individual species. So <clears throat> in no particular order, the Appalachian grizzled skipper, we feel, 
and we don't know this for certain, but probably disappeared from New Jersey sometime in the 1970s. And we have strong circumstantial evidence for this species in the following three or four that the aerial spraying of a bacterial uh, biological um, pesticide or insecticide called BT and others uh, to control gypsy moths had an outsized influence in the disappearance of the skipper. And I say that because um, grizzle skipper has one brood and it flies in the spring. And the caterpillars would probably be moving about munching away uh, sometime in the second half of May. And that is precisely when uh, gypsy moth spraying occurs in northern New Jersey. And grizzle skipper, Appalachian grizzle skipper was only found in northern New Jersey. So, um, and this is a woodland species to boot and, urban, and that uh, gypsy moth spraying only occurs in woodlands. So, uh, and the timing was just about right for that because gypsy moth spraying began <clears throat> sometime in the late 60s, at least on a widespread basis in the late 60s, early 70s. Oh, and uh, I should mention that as is our habit, we like to include as many different photographs from different photographers as possible. <clears throat> so I put the name of the photographer someplace on the screen, usually in the lower right, but not always. The ones that have no name, aside from one special case, are mine. So here we have a map that I got from uh, Rob Soames, who's um, a senior zoologist at the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program at the state and the only um, really invertebrate zoologist at the, at the uh, ENSP. And Rob provided me with some of these um, interesting maps. Now the pink dots that you see scattered about uh, mostly over there in Bergen County represent um, specimens of uh, Appalachian grizzled skipper. The actual physical location of the dot may not be precisely accurate, but you sort of get the general idea. <clears throat> and we have this biotic data for a lot of different species and I'll be showing a few of these later on. And there's also probably more information including dates <clears throat> and perhaps very localized specific directions as well that go with these dots. Another one that we think may have been at least uh, somewhat victimized by uh, gypsy moth spraying is the model dusky wing. This also has a spring brood and it's also a woodland or woodland edge sort of species. So that could have been hurt by uh, gypsy moth spraying. It also has um, only one single host plant, New Jersey tea, which uh, also may have declined uh, we used to find a lot of New Jersey tea in power lines, but um, with the herbicide spraying now, uh, some of the New Jersey teas probably have disappeared. And you can see the map there on the lower left, in this case, yellow dots representing specimen records of the model dusky wing. <clears throat> West Virginia white, this is another similar sort of story. This only has one brood. It's very early, this butterfly begins flying in April and caterpillars are moving about again, the second half of May, this is a woodland species. <clears throat> and um, as such then it was vulnerable or potentially vulnerable to gypsy moth spraying. You can see here there were three specimen record, four specimen records, but there were probably obviously others. So we think that this disappeared sometime shortly after the gypsy moth spraying began. Gypsy moth spraying was designed to control gypsy moths, but it also has lethal and sublethal effects on uh, all caterpillars, uh, moths, butterflies, many, many different species. This is a Jeff Glassberg mm -hmm. photo. Oh, also garlic mustard has been proven, demonstrated, uh, to be a problem for uh, West Virginia white because some females have a habit of laying eggs on garlic mustard instead of the host plant, which is uh, dentaria or toothwort. 
And it's been shown that the caterpillars feeding on uh, aliaria, the garlic mustard, do not do well. In fact, then the impacts apparently are, are lethal or at least sublethal. So that also may have had uh, something to do with the uh, decline and disappearance of West Virginia white. <clears throat> Columbine dusky wing, similar story in other woodland species in the wild that feeds on wild columbine, which is a woodland plant. And we think that this disappeared, the dusky wing sometime in the 1970s as well. You can also get this to feed on, on um, garden columbine. <clears throat> it's also a little bit hard to identify too. It's easily confused with some other species. <clears throat> but um, any, if anybody's out there and sees a dusky wing laying eggs on columbine, uh, please report that. It could simply be a wild indigo dusky wing, which has also been shown to lay eggs on wild columbine, but you never know worth investigating. And the last one of this group would be silvery checker spot. I think the link to pesticides on this one is a bit weaker compared to the other species, <clears throat> as this is more of a woodland opening, woodland edge species. But this disappeared also at about the same time. And you can see the number of yellow dots, specimen records, all from North Jersey for the silvery checker spot. I don't see much of the host plant of this species, which is wing stem, primarily wing stem. You do find it here and there, but it certainly isn't common and that may have declined as well over the years. Now, let's get into some species that declined and disappeared for other reasons, like the glorious regal fritillary. I attended a uh, Zoom meeting, perhaps some of you did as well, about um, management efforts at the Fort Indian Town Gap colony of regal fritillaries and it was discussed in that meeting as to what the um, size of these big open fields that they require what's what's the minimum size and um, I think the figure of 50 acres or 100 acres was was bantered about I think basically the bigger the better and that's what we've suffered here beginning post-world war ii with the booming economy the soldiers coming home um, a lot of good jobs and a lot of homes were being built. This is probably best exemplified by what's referred to as the Hempstead or what used to be referred to as the Hempstead Plains on Long Island, which was, I think, 60,000 contiguous acres of open land that supported all kinds of grassland birds, many, many pairs of upland sandpipers, for example. And that, no doubt, had large numbers, I would guess, of regal fritillaries which occurred in other places on Long Island as well. But as that habitat got chopped up into smaller and smaller open fields, uh, the butterflies disappeared. Same thing in New Jersey, uh, where we have a number of records from the northern half of the state primarily. So that was a real uh, tragic loss there with the regal fritillary. And uh, it would be hard to get it to come back because we just don't have those big areas anymore. The largest open, open areas we have now are on military bases. And also the caterpillars don't feed, apparently don't feed on just any old species of violet. It's been demonstrated at the Fort Indian Town Gap colony anyway, that certain species of violets were greatly preferred and the caterpillars did much, much better on just a few different species of violets. Green comma, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on. We don't really have much information about green comma. There's one specimen record, and that was from Sussex County. With a lot of these northern species, we're going to fall back on climate change as perhaps the major driving influence on the um, disappearance of these species. <clears throat> so we don't even know when that, at least I don't know when that specimen uh, was taken there in Sussex County. For all I know, it could have been in the early 1900s or even older. Nowadays, I think you have to go up into the Catskills uh, to find green comma. They used to be in the Poconos, but I would sincerely doubt they're there anymore. Northern Crescent, um, 
here it is on Oxidacea. I try and identify the plants as well and whether they're alien or um, native. Uh, so as you can guess, Northern Crescent, basically a Northern species. And again, so climate change may have had something to do with this. I think there's only one specimen record of this species as well. And that's also from Sussex County, but it's easily confused with Pearl Crescent. So um, there may be some out there, who knows? Perseus dusky wing, similarly, very easily confused with wild indigo dusky wing. This is a uh, butterfly that feeds, uh, the caterpillars feed primarily on um, Baptisia and uh, wild lupin. At least that's the thinking in New Jersey anyway. <clears throat> so we don't really know when this disappeared. And the reason why we're unsure about that is because it's so easily confused with wild indigo dusky wing, which is much more common. Now, beginning with Mitchell Sater, we have a very good idea as to the year of the last report uh, within a year or two anyway. So some sources say 1985, some say 1986. What we are fairly certain about is that collecting <clears throat> had an outsized influence on the uh, disappearance of Mitchell Sater. By the time the 80s rolled around, it was probably restricted to just a few fens, which are basically calcareous wetlands in Sussex and uh, Warren counties. There's a record for Morris County. I don't know how accurate that is. <clears throat> so um, when these sites became known, there were a lot of collectors back in those days, more so than there are now probably. And they just went in there over and over again, apparently, and collected out the Mitchell Sater. And despite people looking, it has not been reported since 86 and is certainly, I think, gone. Uh, this one was photographed, I photographed in Alabama. And I believe at a site discovered by Jane Scott and Jeff Glassberg. <clears throat> Harris's checker spot. Sharon and I found two colonies of Harris's checker spots uh, back in the 1990s. And the last uh, report was 2003. Beautiful, gorgeous butterfly. It's a northern species. So again, we've uh, implicated climate change in its disappearance. You can still find this not too far away in um, Westchester County, uh, New York, which I think is the nearest uh, known colony at any rate. This just has one host plant, which is flat-topped white aster, aster rumbolatus. I think it has a different name now. <clears throat> the taxonomists keep changing things on us. Um, and the host plant is still out there. You can still find aster umbilatus in lots of different places, uh, sometimes in pretty impressive numbers but the butterfly certainly has disappeared. I think the last reported observation was from the Troy Meadows area. And this is just my picture of a, a lucky shot in the Berkshires where a Pearl Crescent just happened to land next to a Harris's checker spot I was focusing on. This is a <clears throat> scan slide. So you can see the two don't look at all alike. There's no risk of confusing Pearl Crescent with Harris's checker spot. If anybody sees anything that looks like a Harris or Checker spot, give us a call. Arctic Skipper. Um, this was a, a colony that was um, only one colony in the state that we know of that was uh, discovered by uh, club member Tom Hallowell. Hey, Tom, in 1986. And it was reported yearly, well, not yearly thereafter, not until I started going up there and in the 90s and uh, Sharon and I found it there. Interesting uh, story there about that <clears throat> was that uh, during Memorial Day, which happens to be my birthday, May 30th, thank you. Um, we had a habit, Sharon and I had a habit of going up into High Point State Park to uh, look at birds and whatnot. And <clears throat> I pulled off the road on the right-hand side of the road up by Cat Swamp, if any of you know where that is on Sawmill Road. And as we're pulling up, I said, you know, some years ago, Tom Hallowell found an Arctic skipper up here. As I don't know where exactly, but it was up in High Point here along Saw Mill Road someplace. And Sharon opens up the car door and she said, what does it look like? I said, well, it looks like a tiny little fritillary. 
And uh, Sharon opened the car door, looked outside. Oh, she's, you mean that thing? And it, there it was, it was right there. Just open up the car door, there it was. And we'd see up to 15 to 20 uh, per visit um, up until the end, basically. And I think the, the late, great Jim Zamos uh, saw the last one in 2005. So uh, again, Northern species, very much a Northern species. And um, uh, as far as I know, there wasn't any nearby colony anywhere around. So it was kind of a relic population. And this could have been wiped out by any number of things. When populations get very small uh, and, very, and widely separated, they're susceptible to a whole lot of problems. And uh, it could have been uh, bad weather. Um, it could have been a pathogen. It could have been a local outbreak of, um, of insect predators, who knows? or it could have been collecting, it's a desirable species. <clears throat> More recently, Acadian hair streak, which is in the East anyway, it's the most Northern of our hair streaks. Uh, the last year that was seen was 2012, up in uh, Northern Sussex County. Climate change, maybe, or maybe it was uh, something to do with the possible decline of Ant associates, it's very much dependent upon um, uh, probably a species of Formica ant, much like the Edwards hair streak is. And if the ants disappear, then the butterfly disappears. And the place that we saw this last in 2012, I made it a point to look for ant mounds and I did find several, but I couldn't tell whether they were really active or not. And we saw one hair streak, one Acadian hair streak there in 2012. This must have meant the ants tend the larvae. Uh, the ants really tend the larvae, uh, protect the larvae, and the ants get something out of it with the larvae exuding a sweet uh, substance. So um, there's a very interesting relationship that we're not certain about in many species of hair streaks. So, uh, and I think that this has also disappeared largely from Orange County, New York. I'm not certain about that, but I think last time I talked to John Urizari, uh, that's what he told me. Silver border fritillary, this is the subject of the, uh, the first slide there of the program. Sharon and I discovered several colonies in Sussex County back in the 90s. And uh, this was actually a species that, although it's generally considered to be a Northern species, um, back in the 90s, you could find it way down, down to the Delaware Bayshore. And then it was a fairly rapid disappearance of these colonies, like dominoes, one after another. And um, by 2012, we photographed some. By 2013, no more, despite the fact that the habitats are still there. Uh, they feed on violets, the caterpillars do. So what accounted for their disappearance? Uh, we don't know. Uh, 2012 is not that long ago, so it's possible that we've um, there's still one or two colonies out there someplace. But certainly the ones where they were known at have been checked many times since then, and no dice. Okay, now we're going to get into the species that um, may be in trouble. I'm not going to spend too much time on the checkered white or the next one, the sleepy orange because this going back in history, this has, um, it's very episodic. It has sporadic invasions uh, where they establish temporary residency and then they disappear again. So it's not your classic resident species, but they're mostly found down in the Southwestern part of the state lately down around Salem County. Sleepy orange, same thing. Although sleepy orange has become a little bit more prevalent these days and a bit more northern, it's established. Well, who knows how established it is, but recently large numbers have been reported from the, uh, the Duke Farms there in Somerset County. So uh, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But getting, get, getting back to some more uh, typical resident populations that have been around for God knows how long, we got this pair of elephants frosted and hoary, both South Jersey species, coastal plain species. Problem with these is that there's relatively few colonies. A lot of the colonies are small and some of them are in areas that are susceptible to um, 
ooh, mismanagement in the form of uh, too much management or too little management, too frequent management, and these would be in uh, utility line easements. The hoary elephant on the bottom right there is perched on its host plant, Bearberry, which is, it is very, very closely tied to. Bronze copper has populations in South Jersey down around Salem County. I don't know how they're doing. I think recently they haven't been doing too good. We've discovered, when I say we, I mean, butterflyers have, dis have uh, discovered a few new colonies up in the northern part of the state. But all of these colonies are very small. Uh, I think that they come and go. Um, the host plant is certainly common, it's dock. And the colony that we looked at up at the Wallkill Refuge last year, there was no dock around, but we think they were feeding on polygonum, which is an alternate host, smartweed. So they're vulnerable because the populations are very small and basically widely scattered. Aphrodite is another northern and western species. Beautiful photographs here by Mike Newland. The one on the left is on a wild bergamot. And we used to get in our yard here in Sussex County, we would get multiple Aphrodite fritillaries every year up until the time they, well, they just didn't show up anymore. I think that was 2012. And we haven't seen one since. I think Fred Weber up there in um, Culver's Lake has had one more recently, but even on the Springdale 4th of July count, which covers a good bit of Sussex County and Northern Warren County, um, there haven't been any reports the past several years. We used to get them otherwise most every year. Climate change, um, who knows? The fritillaries are the caterpillars. The caterpillars may be vulnerable. A lack of snow. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Sharon just reminded me that um, I need frequent reminding and minding. Um, uh, Sharon pointed out that the caterpillars may need um, a good snow cover in order to make it through the winter and not dry out. Um, and I know this year is not the year to mention that about snow cover, but many of the previous years, there really hasn't really been much in the way of a persistent snow cover, um, even up here in the Northwestern part of the state. So who knows whether that has had any impact on the survivorship of uh, Aphrodite fritillary caterpillars in, in the winter and fritillaries in general, basically. I mean, we've seen a decline in Greg Spangle fritillary, meadow fritillary, and uh, the aforementioned silver bordered fritillary. Gray comma, very limited distribution, basically Hunterdon County, small population. The host plant of the caterpillar is endangered and it's very locally distributed. The largest population that we found of that host plant is in Hunterdon County where Paula Williams discovered, not coincidentally, the largest colony of, that we know of, of gray commas but I use largest sort of apologetically because I don't think anyone's reported more than 10 or 12 individuals at any one time. So the place is not overrun with gray commas, despite the fact that at one point, I think we counted over a thousand stems of the, uh, of the host plant. So uh, that's a vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable species because of its very limited distribution and small population. Another couple of very nice photographs from Mike Newland. Baltimore checker spot. This is again, basically a Northern species, although you can find its range going down the spine of the Appalachians, I think all the way to Georgia, but it is basically a Northern species. So climate change may have, uh, may be implicated here. We certainly know that deer love turtle heads. They just nip off the tops of turtle head plants, whatever they can find them. And also collecting. Um, it's a beautiful butterfly. And um, would they be susceptible collecting? If I was a collector, I'd want a Baltimore checker spot. In fact, 
where we looked for the, where we last saw the Acadian hair streak up in Vernon, uh, there was also a nice population of Baltimore checker spots there. This was 2012. And as we were, there was a group of us, as we were looking in this uh, Fen area, we saw several people with nets coming our way and they spotted us and heard us and they did a, a 180 and hightailed it out of there. What they were there for, I don't know. Maybe the Acadian hair streak, maybe Baltimore checker spot. Maybe they just like walking around with nets. I don't know. But we think there was something nefarious afoot there. Compton tortoise shell, again, a northern species. Climate change, probably. Most reports of the past several years have been up in the Pequannock watershed in Morris and Passaic counties and nearby Weweyanda State Park. But we used to get, just as an example, in our yard here in southern Sussex County, we used to get multiple Compton tortoise shells every year until they disappeared in the early 2000s. They would land on our office window uh, that overwinter here as adults. They'd be everywhere and the host plants are common, birches and willows and whatnot. So um, uh, how, are they retreating northward with climate change? Who knows, possibly. And the one on the bottom right, actually we found luckily it had just emerged from its chrysalis, which is still hanging on to. <clears throat> we had as many as 13 that particular day and um, we haven't seen anything like that since. One of our favorite species and the one that we spend quite a bit of time working on is Northern Meadowmark. It's down to three, as far as we know, three locations in New Jersey, but back in the 80s and 90s when Dave Norris from Rhode Island studied them, there were dozens, dozens and dozens of locations um, in um, Southern Sussex County and Northern Warren County, essentially extending from Branchville to Blairstown, but a very, very small area. <clears throat> One of the colonies uh, was formally managed by Sharon and the Ridge and Valley Conservancy until we got the heave ho from uh, Warren County. Well, we got the heave, I don't know about the ho. <clears throat> um, but the largest colony is nearby and it was discovered by Robert Soames of the Endangered Non-Game Species Program and has been monitored now for several years <clears throat> by Biostar Associates and colleagues of ours and the Natural Lands Trust. And they do a little bit of management there too. This is in a, uh, a power line. <clears throat> so this is probably one of our most imperiled New Jersey species being the fact that it's down to just a few areas and two of those areas, it's pretty precarious due to uh, very small numbers. Well, why do we say this is the one we know what's causing the decline? <laughs> yeah, so Sharon just reminded me again that uh, we know what's causing the decline of this species and it is the invasive plant species. They are overrunning uh, this metal mark habitat. And we know for a fact that one colony, um, the, plant, the host plants were overrun with uh, stilt grass and that colony winked out <clears throat> pretty quickly. So we have to really actively manage, and I mean like every year, go in there to this one colony that we still visit despite the fact that uh, that Warren County is, um, well, they're not even aware of it. So <clears throat> that we're not officially managing it, but we do it on our own uh, with the help of Rob Soames from the ENSP. So, um, but that's overrun with those alien species I mentioned, bittersweet, Asiatic bittersweet, um, autumn olive, Maro's honeysuckle and, and stilt grass. And the, the, the other important thing about that is we can get rid of the invasive species, but that's not enough, or at least we can keep them at bay. But it's very important that they have nectar plants as well, because these do not, butterflies disperse very well to find nectar sources. So we have to plant nectar sources right near the host plant. And the primary nectar source is black-eyed Susan. They'll also do um, a butterfly weed, which we also plant, um, other milkweeds, and um, oxidase, which is an alien. <clears throat> but unfortunately, the deer also like some of those plants. So one year we planted a whole bunch of um, black-eyed Susans, didn't protect them with cages, went back there and the deer had uprooted every one of them. They didn't eat them. 
they were just tasting them. They pulled them out of the ground and tossed them off onto the rubble, onto the rubbish heap. So we got smarter after that and we planted them and caged them. And so now we have a nice little group of black-eyed Susans growing. But again, the invasive species we have to keep on top of every single year. Some other ones that are declining and limited to relatively few locations is eyed brown. Uh, basically, it's a northern New Jersey species. And we really know of only a few places where this can be found in any numbers. And it's all up in uh, Sussex County, primarily in the wall kill drainage, actually. <clears throat> now, Georgia Sater is an interesting case because one of our South Jersey colleagues, Brian Johnson, uh, alerted me last year, I believe it was, to the fact that he came across uh, on eBay uh, sales of a Georgia Sater that specifically mentioned that they were collected in New Jersey. Um, there's not a whole lot of colonies of these uh, this species. I think they're finding more and more, but um, it's subject to great variations in population and some places that used to have them don't have them anymore. And when you throw in the collecting angle, this is also, in my opinion, also a vulnerable species. It's quite attractive, as you can see. <clears throat> and apparently the object of, uh, of collectors that um, trade them and obviously uh, sell them. Cobweb skipper, I wasn't aware of until a few years ago that I was thought it was still pretty strong in South Jersey where we used to go down to see it. But I've been told by our South Jersey colleagues that it's become harder to find in, uh, in the traditional locations in South Jersey. But at the same time, it's become a little easier to find in North Jersey. At least we've had more reports. Sharon and I did a survey up on Barefoot Mountain, <clears throat> right adjacent to Way Way On the State Park. And uh, we found cobweb skippers in, a, in many of the forest openings there and along the uh, power line. And if we have some other photographs here, a lovely photograph by Fred Pfeiffer down there in the lower left from Mountainside Park. And then Clay Sutton contributed the photograph on the right. This is how you would typically see them. You know, they're landing on little stones or on sand like that. And this is an early flyer. So all of these photographs, uh, well, the ones in North Jersey certainly uh, may, and the South Jersey one could be as early as uh, late April. So why are they declining? Don't know, I have no idea. A rogo skipper is something that Sharon and I worked on for several years uh, back in the 90s and into the 2000s. We discovered several new populations in Morris County. We believe all of those are gone now. Here's a, this is a crummy photograph, but it's a scanned slide of one that we found in Morris County nectaring out of Deptford Pink. Pretty cool. Here's another one, the one, the, the, the bottom one is an Oroco, so you can see the white edged veining on the hind wing below. And a Del uh, compare that to a Delaware skipper above. The Delaware skipper has orange fringes to the hind wing and the fore wing, whereas the Oroco has white and uh, that's a blunt leaf milkweed there, which is one of our uh, less common milkweeds. It's an upland species, but probably my favorite milkweed. And there is a sweat bee. Don't ignore the sweat bee. But we haven't found um, some of these places have become overgrown. Other ones look the same as they did before, but we just cannot find any Oroco skippers anymore at those locations. Uh, they also occur in South Jersey. But I believe the survey for them last year did not turn up any. Uh, I'm not certain about that, but I think that was the case. Here's another shot of a female and tumbling flower beetles on an oxide daisy. So this is another one like Northern Metal Mark, extremely imperiled in New Jersey. Dotted skipper is another one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with dotted skipper. It is not a northern New Jersey species, and we don't get down to South Jersey as much as we used to. It's found in a few colonies. Most of the populations are small. 
Um, usually you see them in dry habitats, although the one on the lower left was taken in a wetland by Pat Sutton. And the one on the right is a scanned slide of mine of Pine Barrens, uh, nectaring at Pine Barrens Sandborn. Uh, you can find these as far north as Collier's Mills Wildlife Management Area in Ocean County. I think that they're still there, although I'm not certain about that. So that's another species that is declining. When Sharon and I did work down in South Jersey professionally, we would occasionally come across dotted skippers along uh, utility uh, easements. And some people, I'm gonna pause here. Some people ask me, how do we get such terrific photographs of butterflies? And when I say they ask me, they're basically asking how does the club get such wonderful photographs of butterflies because they go to the club website and they see those terrific pictures. And I say, well, it takes experience. You gotta know when to go and where to go and, and uh, you gotta have the right camera equipment. But even a cell phone these days takes really top-notch photographs. And, um, you know, just takes some experience, but there's also, there's also technique involved. And here's an interesting technique um, from, um, uh, what's that preserve down there? And, um, <laughs> ah, it'll come, the Franklin Parker preserve. <clears throat> and here we have um, club member, Chris Williams, hanging on to Will Curling, who's gotten way out over his feet and would be risk of falling into the muck. So Chris is hanging on to him while Will photographs, I believe a dotted skipper was the subject of this, uh, of this photograph. It's a Pat Sutton photograph. Pat Sutton shared this with me. But I think Pat missed a, missed a chance here. I would have reversed things. I would have had Will holding Chris. <laughs> you see, that would have been much more amusing because Will would not have been able to hold on to Chris. He would have had to have let go. Chris would have fallen into the muck. He could have turned around, sat down, and looked up at Will and said, now here's another fine mess you've gotten me into, a perfect Laurel and Hardy moment. But eh, what kind of, with missed opportunities, we got a lot of missed opportunities. Uh, I'm glad we missed that opportunity. Uh-oh, <laughs> mute, mute them. Okay, here's a favorite of ours, of Sharon's and mine, uh, Leonard Skipper. This disappeared from our yard, it was here annually. Many of you old time uh, butterflyers got to see it. It was easy to find in our yard every year up until 2012, I think. Yeah. Um, then they disappeared, just gone, haven't been seen since. There are relatively few colonies. There used to be some nice ones down in South Jersey. As far as I know, they're all gone for reasons unknown. The two largest ones in North Jersey, we visit every year and monitor and they're decent, but hardly robust. I mean, we're talking about, you know, maybe 10 to 15, which is, as I say, not a robust population. That's very precarious. Our largest uh, number recently was in the thirties. And that was at the Yards Creek Reservoir. I can mention where that is because it's, uh, it's off limits, you can't get in there. <clears throat> the most often seen nectaring at blue and purple flowers, and this just has one flight period beginning around mid-August and toward the end of September. A marvelous looking butterfly. Why it's disappeared and retracted from its South Jersey range, we don't know. The host plant, the caterpillar food plant is still common. It's a uh, little blue stem grass. And, um, there's lots of places with little blue stem grass, big and small. And the places around here in our, around our neighborhood were just little patches of little blue stem grass in people's backyards. That's all it was. There was no big fields of little blue stem grass and um, just disappeared. But as I say, when populations get very small, they're susceptible to a whole host of reasons that would account for their, for their winking out. Climate change. They've gone higher and higher. <laughs> oh, Sharon thinks maybe climate change is implicated with this, although this does have a range well to our south and not just in the mountains, but maybe they're disappearing from down there too. Long dash, while well, I showed you a photograph of that open meadow uh, at Swartzwood State Park uh, that was open in 2002, but then became invaded with uh, primarily alien invasive shrubs in, in uh, 2013 and they disappeared. 
<clears throat> what's interesting though, this is another Northern species incidentally. So again, climate change may be a factor here, but what's interesting is when you think about it, going back many years, uh, when I first started getting interested in nature, the shrubs that succeeded into open fields were basically native species like um, Cornus racemosa, the gray or stiff dogwood, other species of dogwoods, viburnums, um, rupus species. Um, and these are species that didn't uh, grow very large um, and they didn't grow super fast, the native species for the most part. So many years afterwards, and they would sort of grow in a clumped pattern. So many years thereafter, you could still find large openings in these fields. A little field next to our house is an, a good illustration of this. When we first moved here in 1989, it was a, a little field next to our house. It wasn't very big, uh, maybe an acre or two, that's it. And it just had a few native species of shrubs. It was basically open. And we had breeding ruffed grouse there. There was blue wing warbler, there was Brewster's warbler, prairie warbler, a lot of these successional field species. But then the area got invaded with autumn olive and marrow honeysuckle. They grow very large. They have very wide aerial coverage. That is to say, they have a very spreading growth habit. And before you knew it, in the blink of an eye, all of those birds disappeared. The area was almost completely covered with those alien invasive shrubs. And I think that's what's happening here is that these, these fields are just being overrun with these very, very aggressive, fast growing, large alien shrub species. And which is why uh, land management is so laborious because the state and other, or, and other uh, agencies and other conservation entities buy up a lot of land. A lot of it is open fields, but there's not an endowment or a commitment to manage it to keep out the invasive species. And these invasive shrubs are everywhere. So no matter where you have an open field, you're gonna be getting up here anyway, Mara's honeysuckles, Tartarian honeysuckles, uh, uh, autumn Multiflora. olive, um, multiflora, uh, and, and, and it's just gonna take over so fast. And the habitat management, the, 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 the effort to get rid of these species is very laborious. And we're gonna see an example of that shortly. Indian skipper is another one that disappeared in our yard in 2016. And um, it's a Northern species, um, habitat succession rapidly declining number of sites. You can still find this. It's not rare, but it's not nearly as common and widespread as it used to be. Okay, we're getting down toward the end here. Two Spotted Skipper, these are contributions from our South Jersey colleagues. Again, uh, this used to be found in North Jersey. There are records, I believe, from Sussex County. I've never seen it. I don't know of anyone who has seen it in Northern New Jersey but you can still find it in some places in South Jersey, although, uh, and my South Jersey colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the populations are terribly robust down there. I think uh, you just see a few individuals here and there. <clears throat> the habitat is still there, but uh, I think the butterfly itself has declined. Another northern species is pepper and salt skipper. Many of us have seen this on our field trip up to High Point in uh, late May or uh, early June. The largest colony up there at High Point was discovered by David Ifner, who was the mailman by, uh, by uh, trade, and me. One day we were up there looking for the uh, Arctic skipper. I was showing him the Arctic skipper. And... Um, uh, I found a pepper and salt skipper, didn't know what it was at the time. And I got Ifner to look at it and he said, oh, I know what that is, that's pepper and salt skipper. So that was a new one for me and it was a new location. Here it is nectaring at wild geranium, which was also the favorite flower of the um, since departed Arctic skipper. 
And common roadside skipper, which is far from common. Very few known sites, all with fewer than 10 individuals. Um, in fact, the colony, well, colony, <laughs> the site that we've been following, the most we've ever had is four individuals. Um, so this is Jim Springer's excellent photograph from along the Appalachian Trail uh, up in Warren County, Northern Warren County. And there's um, my only credited photo is this lousy photo in the lower right. But this is how you typically see them. They're very, very tiny. And the fact that they're so dark makes them look even smaller. And they fly very fast and usually very close to the ground. And um, they're just a very, very, very sparsely distributed. We have seen them in South Jersey at a couple of locations, but I don't know when the last report was from uh, South Jersey. So what are we doing to uh, help the situation here? Well, <clears throat> the Endangered and Ongame Species Program asked us, that is uh, Sharon and I, to uh, go around to wildlife management areas and select likely areas, fields, that could be um, resurrected into good pollinator habitat. And there were various factors that went into our selection. Um, I guess the, mo the, uh, the most important of which was that it no longer represented good pollinator, insect pollinator habitat. So um, we found this field on the Columbia Wildlife Management Area uh, back around 2019 or so. And here you see in the lower right an aerial photograph of that field as it appeared in 2017. And by comparison in the upper left was a very similar aerial photograph taken in 2002. You can see it was an open field at the time and probably had lots of uh, pollinator plants. So you can see how, and this, how rapidly in, in, in 15 years, the autumn olive and other things, uh, multiflora rose and autumn olive primarily invaded that area. So that was one area that we selected. And in 2020, uh, the state came in and cleared it. And the plan is to, uh, to seed in a native pollinator mix uh, this year. And then we're gonna follow it and see what happens. But this is going to have to be actively managed too. You can see in the upper right, all of those green shrubs there along the edge, those are almost all autumn olives. Now that's on private property. But the birds are going to uh, certainly disperse that into this field. So they're going to have to come in here every year, or every other year, and mow it. And we've pretty much got a verbal commitment from the state that that's exactly what they're going to do. And we've selected some other sites that are going to be treated similarly um, over the next few years. The state came into some money uh, to do this sort of work. And the other thing that Sharon and I have been doing, as I mentioned before, is getting rid of invasive species and planting nectar plants for the imperiled northern metal mark. Um, something that really has to be, I mean, every time you go there, there seems to be a new alien species that's invaded that you have to now control in addition to the other species that you have to control every year. So it's, um, it's almost fighting a losing battle. We get older and um, less willing and less able to, to put the, uh, as much work in as we used to. And um, and the invasive species just uh, keep on coming. Well, remember, it's not just us, Jim helped us. And Other people have helped too over the years uh, here and at another location in Sussex County too. Um, Tom and Jim and uh, Joe and Marge and a few other people have helped out as well. And um, so it's a group effort, but everyone's aging. And what we need are some young people. Rob Soames from the NSP has helped out quite a bit. So, um, but it's a, it's, it's a young person's game. So here are the sources that I've consulted. Uh, not many, but uh, all valuable. There's a list of uh, photographers. I like to include uh, lots of different people if I can. 
Special thanks to Sharon. This program looks a whole lot better. I would have just had one black screen with white letters after another, uh, but Sharon made it look very, very presentable. So uh, that was wonderful. Uh, again, any mistakes are mine. So at this point, um, I'll entertain questions, comments, and what's that in very small print? Oh yeah, criticisms uh from everybody this is an american snout this is something that we can see on uh on field trips particularly in south jersey but also up here in the northern part of the state who knew that the male northern snout only has four obvious legs well probably most of you actually so um so that's it that was a very uh, brief and quick tour through uh a pretty depressing uh, subject i know but um Oh, and again, just let me repeat that uh, if anybody has any ideas about field trips, or if you want to volunteer as a field trip leader, please shoot me off an email, because I do want to come up with a uh, tentative uh, list of uh, field trips, uh, certainly by sometime in uh, toward the end of March, so we can have a chance to uh, discuss it and uh, settle on a few things. Questions. Questions or comments. So, anybody has any questions or comments there, uh, Jen? Anybody? Uh, anybody Wade, th Wade, this. Turn yes, Joanna. Wait, Mike, turn yours down. Wow, Mike doesn't know how to turn it down. That's horrific. <laughs> Mike, turn it down. It's like you were being invaded by aliens. <laughs> okay, he doesn't know how to turn it down. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. First of all, this was terrific, and I would encourage you to- Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's still a lot of feedback there. Um, hold on. Uh, um, wait, are you able to make me host again? So on my picture, there should be three little dots in the corner, and you can just hit make host. Uh, I can't know. Can we do stop screen sharing? Will that work? <laughs> that, that will just stop the screen sharing. Um, so you'd have to move the mouse over my picture. Oh, your picture. I oh, see. I see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, make host. Make host. Yeah. Make host. Just so I can mute um, anyone like in case like there is feedback. Okay. There okay. you go. There we go. Okay. Joanna, I think I can mute Mike now. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Okay. I want to say this was really, really interesting and very good and a lot of data. And I would encourage you to write it up for something, if not if not a professional journal, at least for butterflies, so that it's actually there and somebody can refer to it. It's really a lot of work. And I, actually, you know, actually, yeah. Joanna, a lot of this is in the book that you and Mike wrote. <laughs> well, I know that, but a lot of it is updates, and That's you can true. update. You can uh, yes. you can update. Yeah. No. I'm. Just, yeah, yes. I agree with Joanna. Hello, um, Peter. How are you? Good. You so? Excellent. Yeah, listen, you mentioned uh, silvery checker spot disappearing in the 70s. I sent you a photo of one I took in Bergen County in 1985. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, did I actually receive that photo? I think so. I oh. uh, sent it also to Mike Goshfeld and Jim Springer. Oh. Well, Mike and Jim were remiss in not reminding me about it. Okay. But thank you for that, Peter. That's an interesting report. What year was that again? 1985, June 16th. And- uh, Do you know uh, where in Brigham County? Yeah, it was at uh, Greenbrook Sanctuary, Palisades Nature Association. Oh, really? And um, uh, they had a, they had a, well, they have a recent checklist of the butterflies there, but they left out all the critical stuff. There was a previous uh, checklist done by the, uh, the uh, naturalist uh, director who, uh, I forget his name now, he uh, has since deceased, but he had a number of records of uh, that butterfly uh, over the years at uh, Greenbrook. I may have a copy of that checklist somewhere. If what, you uh, what, um, what uh, brood was that, Peter? Was that the, uh, it, has, it has a few different broods. Was that an early brood? Was that uh, like a May? Well, I said the, 
the bird I the butterfly I photographed was June sixteenth. Oh, okay. All right. 1985. I can resend the picture if you like. Yeah, that'd be good. I'm just writing this down. 6 1685 photographed by Wade Wander. I mean, Peter Post. Okay. <laughs> if you Got want to it. take credit, I don't mind. No, Peter, I'm just joking with you. I know that. You're the biggest kidder of them all. You think <laughs> I don't know that by now? So. So anyway, it was a terrific presentation. Uh, I have a few other comments if you, uh, let me see. Well, let's see if anybody else wants to, uh, wants to horn in here. Uh, uh, I, was going Janet, to interject, I was going to interject while you're on the silvery checker spot. There's a location uh, in nearby in Pennsylvania, a serpentine area where silvery checker spot did occur along with model dusky wing. Oh, that's down in the southeastern part of the state, right? Right. Wait, and yeah. I wonder if, if those are gone from there as well. In no, words, no, I thought about that, but I haven't been able to get much information, recent information about um, butterflies in Pennsylvania like I can in New Jersey. Yeah. Networking. This is great, Wade. Very exciting. Very nice. Now you need some butterflies increasing for your next talk. Wade. Fred has a question. I loved your program. Yeah, Wade. Wade, Fred Weber. Yes. How would how would the Camp Olympia site be for the state restoration program? Well, unfortunately, currently the restoration program only applies to wildlife management areas. Oh. Okay. We hope we hope that that will be expanded into uh, other state land like. Uh, uh, parks and forests, uh, things like that. But right now, currently, well, it's if only it ever is, is, if it ever is, that that'd be a good site. The olive olive is really taken over in there. And that would be a great. That would be a great spot. We've thought about that, and I suggested okay. a few other spots to them at Swartzwood State Park, and they. I was reminded that these look like great spots, but it's a state park, and we can't do state parks right now. Only okay. Wildlife. I see. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'll let you know if that changes, though. Hopefully, that'll yeah. change. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Um. So, in the comments, I'm just gonna read so far what has been posted, and then we'll go back to in case anyone has any questions um, that wants to unmute themselves. Okay. So, um, I apologize in advance if I say anybody's name incorrectly. Um, I'm just reading them as they appear in the chat. So C.S. wrote, thank you for a necessary presentation of the reality, very sobering. <laughs> um, the Butterfly Club of New Jersey, which I'm assuming is Caroline. Um, <laughs> Caroline wrote, I also noticed the roadsides are being sprayed heavily in my county, Passaic, starts in early spring and is done to kill the weeds on the edges of the road. Um, Gary wants to know how many of these species are federally endangered or threatened? Um, well, Mitchell Sater and uh, Oroko Skipper, possibly, although Oroko Skipper may just be nominated for threatened status. I'm pretty sure Mitchell Sater is already classified. Uh, Mike, uh, Joanna, anybody no, else want to add anything? I think you're right. Mitchell is endangered. Oroko, I thought, is state endangered. Well, it is, but I thought I thought this question was federal. Was that was it I federal? I wouldn't be surprised. Now, let me bring it back up. It says, "How many of these species are federally endangered or right. threatened?" Yeah. Right. So, I don't know about Orogos. Um, if they're dividing out the eastern population, it, it might be that Orogos is nominated. I think there was some talk about nomination of of uh, threatened species. If, if Rob Soames is is uh, is on this uh, is on this uh, program? He may know. I'm looking uh, at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Arogos is neither threatened or endangered at this time. Okay, so it may just be Mitchell Sater at this point. Okay. I'm gonna open it back up to anyone who would like to take their microphone and just talk. Um, and if anyone else wants to put questions in the chat, I will periodically jump back in and read them out. Yes. But very nice talk. Thank you, Wade. 
Thank You're you, welcome. Thank You're welcome, you. everybody. Wait, I, I have a question. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, yep. we can hear you. Yeah. Um, have you ever gotten into the Hercules property to look for a Rogo skipper? Yes, we did get into the Hercules property once when it was still owned by Hercules. Uh, now it's gone through other owners, but we, we got a tour of there because we had to be, we had to have a minder because of all of the unexploded ordnance um, in there. Um, but we did find the Rogos in there. It's a huge area, the habitat's great. And we also found a Rogos right outside along the fence line of the Hercules plant. But we haven't been able, well, that outside of that first visit, we haven't been able to get back in. Um, we used to find it there right on Route 46. Um, and have not found it there in years. In many years now, yeah. yeah. There used to be, you know, quite a few there. Yeah. But. It looks like a lot of truck trucks are parked in that area. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a lot of uh, they've leased that out to uh, to a lot of trucks. Yes, that area is not what it used to be. Was that that little uh, uh, Kenville site, Sharon and Wade? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was a real easy spot to go to go find them. Oh, incidentally, I have a question for people. How was my Russian accent? Was it more Latvian or was it, uh, you know? Oh, God. Oh, uh, you, got to re you got to reply. No, no, no. No, no good. <laughs> well, you didn't sound no Russian. One, no. Sputnik, Sputnik. Russian or Latvian. <laughs> it's neither Russian nor Latvian. Joe is neither Russian nor Latvian. Oh, well, yeah, but Joe might have a better idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it didn't impress me with Russian very uh, at all, but Sputnik, <laughs> after that Nick at the end, get that one and it'd be closer. <laughs> hey, hey, Wade, uh, hey, Wade, I have a professional question. Why is it that uh, we don't list, um, you know, Adelphi this to death and and get some of these listed and uh, aggressively protect it habitat specifically um, to try to, to make some of this come back to life. Oh boy. Well, it has been, I'm answering this one. It has been Delphi. I was on the last Delphi, which was I think 2013 or 15. We came up with a whole list and it's yep. never been um, implemented. Right. It was never. It was never published in the register. Yeah, they're not taking it very and seriously. And that's it's that's a constant problem. You know, they invite all these experts to to go around through all of these rounds, spend all this time evaluating whether something's endangered or threatened or declining, and then they then they don't publish the list. So by the time they get it, then by the time they do publish it, if they ever publish it, it's out of date. So it's, we've kind of thrown up our hands about that. There ought to be some sort of requirement that these lists be published within six months, but that's not gonna happen. Hey so, Wade, my township has gotten the forest service to burn some of our fields. Is that a nice, a good option? Because they did pass a law where you can't have your, where you can have them come out and burn, burn a field. Uh, they can even burn the understory of a forest, too, like if it's got a lot of Japanese barberry. Um, well, the idea of the impact or the benefits of burning versus uh, mowing um, is an ongoing uh, discussion. And there are people who know more about it than I do. Um, but yes, that is an option. And they do a lot of burning up here. Kittatinny Valley State Park fields are burned uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, what, one important thing is you don't burn more than a quarter to a third of the habitat at one time because it does um, impact overwintering stages that are in the leaf litter uh, and in the plants. So you want to leave a refuge of a, a good part, you know, more than you burn. Uh, so that they, from that side, they can recolonize where you burn because you do set back all kinds of invertebrate populations when you burn. 
I mean, it has, does have its advantages. It takes out woody species to a certain extent, but uh, it can impact the invertebrates. It's, it's kind of a very, a very narrow range of heat because if you don't, if it's not a hot enough burn, it will not kill the autumn olives. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Wade, I have a question. Uh, yes, there, me. How are you? Uh, has there ever been any thought of reintroducing a species if an area is still, you know, capable of handling them? Oh, good idea. I like that question. I've always thought that West Virginia white, if we wanted to reintroduce it, the place to do it would be Jenny Jump because one of the, um, one of the specimen records was right near Jenny Jump. And Jenny Jump is, has got the biggest population of the host plant, the caterpillar food plant, Dentaria toothwort, that we've seen anywhere in New Jersey. Um, and it also has a very manageable population currently of um, garlic mustard. Uh, so if the state made a commitment to get rid of the garlic mustard, which could be easily done with a large group effort, um, but where would you get the West Virginia whites from? Well, I mean, they're in Connecticut, they're not too far away, but that would be something that would be beyond our scope to do that would be up to the endangered non game species program mm -hmm. to work out something with the uh, sister agency in another state. But if we were to do that, that would be the location. I've thought about regal fritillary, but we just, I mean, the only place for regal fritillary to reintroduce would be on some of these um, military bases or maybe, uh, you know, like Atlantic City Airport, for example, maybe. Okay. You got to have a huge area and preferably a huge area that's near other huge areas. And we just don't really have that in New Jersey. And, um, but I mean, it's something to consider. We've done it with other species, not necessarily butterflies, but uh, we've done it with other taxa. So, um, so I don't know, I don't know. You'd have to, uh, would have to talk to the state about that and it'd have to be a pretty big commitment, but yeah, it's possible. We, we work closely with Rob Soames, and to our knowledge, the state has never considered uh, reintroducing any uh, endangered species or extirpated species. Um, so I, I think the chances of that are very, very long, unfortunately. It would be fun to try with some things. Um, I, know that, I know that people have approached us about sending northern metal marks up into... Uh, yeah up into other places north of us to recolonize some of their lost populations. And that there has been, yes, there has been talk of that, but, um, but that's never, we did, we, we don't said, have enough to spare. We, we said, forget <laughs> that, we just don't have enough to spare. Uh, I'm just gonna jump in and just read some of the comments as they're coming in and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Donna. Um, so Lou Rosenberg says, thanks Wade and Sharon for an interesting look at the lost butterfly. Uh, Marcus Gray says, thanks Wade and Sharon. Uh, Connie and Tom Hallowell says, say great program Wade and Sharon. And Jack Connor says, super presentation Wade. Thanks to you and Sharon for pulling together all the info experience and info. The last record of of common roadside skipper in South Jersey was 5-11-2010 on Woodbine Railroad tracks. Uh, last Leonard's we have for our SJ records was 9-11-2013 from AC Airport. May still be there, but in area, not open to the public. And then Pat and Clay Sutton say, Wade and Sharon, terrific and much needed presentation. Thanks so much for pulling it all together and sharing it with us. And I'm gonna- Wait. Give it back to Donna. <laughs> and and I, I will reiterate what everyone has said. That was an excellent presentation, took a tremendous amount of research and work, and we truly appreciate it. And I'm really glad that's been recorded. That way we'll get it out and other people, it'll be available for others. Can I uh, say one other thing uh, regarding Columbine Dusky Wing? Uh, Jeff Ingram uh, found them just uh, near the George Washington Bridge. Um, I don't know what his latest records were, but you know, he was a collector 
He's now deceased, but his collection is in the possession of Eric Quinter. So you may want to track that down to see what the dates are there. When you say near the GW Bridge, you're talking about Palisades? You're talking about the Palisades? I'm talking about the Palisades, the area where they have that thousand steps going down to the river. He told me he had them there, right at the top, just okay. near the bridge. Cool. All right. So you might want to check that out. What the latest dates were, I don't know. But as I say, his collection is uh, with Eric Winter. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Peter. Wade, just so you know, Paul and I know of an area that has a, a large colony in Pennsylvania of uh, Virginia Whites, if we ever want to try and reintroduce them. Well, again, we couldn't, we, we couldn't do it. It would have to be a state. It would have to be a state thing. I wouldn't want to get into Dutch with the uh, state people. But thanks, Chris. Uh, uh, that's good. Is that in uh, Eastern, um, Central PA or Western PA? I'm assuming? Western PA. We Western. we've had it when we're visiting Paula's sister in Western PA. They also have people. Okay. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've had really good comments. Uh, wonderful information presented tonight wade thank you so much and sharon also and uh we'll definitely be looking forward to uh next month uh when we switch over to sharon and uh if anyone has any further comments i'm sure if you direct them to wade's email he'll be happy to uh get back to you so thank thanks you, so wade. much for joining us thanks so long everybody so for coming happy march great night Good night, everyone. Good night. Jen, you could uh, end for everybody? Yep, I'm going to do it right now. Thank Have you so much. Night. Good night, Thank all. You.